Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor of Vision at Holy City Church. I'm glad that you found our online sermon resources, and I pray that the Lord would use them to strengthen your faith. I would exhort you not to use our online sermon resources as a substitute for regular involvement in your own local church. That being said, I pray that our teaching resources would be helpful to you and conform you even more to the image of Christ. Acts chapter 6, verse 8, through Acts chapter 8, verse 3. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the uh, Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from uh, Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And the high priest said, Are these these things so? And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father, Abraham, when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred, and go to the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans, and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others, who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him out of all his affliction and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known, as, known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob his father and all his kindred, 75 persons in all, And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had uh, had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, It came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel, 
And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness on, of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man, God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise you up, or will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him but thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your god, Rephan, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern he had seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God, and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my home, or is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, up, or opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. 
And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentations over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Uh, the 16th century was a wild time for both the monarchy and the church and England. Henry VIII separated from Roman Catholicism in 1534 because the Pope refused to grant him a divorce. And Henry began the Church of England, officially, uh, officially ushering in Protestantism into the nation. It's always a good reason to start a church, right? <laughs> Around this same time, Hugh Latimer was converted and moved from Roman Catholicism to Protestantism, uh, becoming one of Henry's chief advisors. After Henry's death, his son Edward VI assumed the throne, and Latimer became a well-known Protestant preacher during Edward's reign. Edward was also Protestant. King Edward also appointed the Protestant Nicholas Ridley, first to the office of Bishop of Rochester and then eventually to the office of Bishop of London. Latimer and Ridley preached the word and busied themselves with meeting the needs of the poor in their cities and with meeting, uh, addressing social injustices. Uh, but then King Edward died and his sister Mary, a Roman Catholic, became queen. And she became known as Bloody Mary. She threw a number of faithful Protestant preachers in jail, as well as condemning many of them to death because of their refusal to embrace Roman Catholicism's false teaching. Latimer and Ridley were both imprisoned and eventually sentenced to be burned at the stake by the Roman Catholic religious leaders, professing Christians of the day. So here's a, I just wanted to read a shortened retelling from John Fox, Fox's Book of Martyrs, retelling of Latimer and Ridley's last day, October 16th, 1555. Fox writes, Dr. Ridley, entering the place of execution first, earnestly holding up both his hands, looked toward heaven, towards heaven, then shortly after seeing Mr. Latimer, with a cheerful look, he ran to him and embraced him, saying, be, a good, be of good heart, brother, for God will either assuage the fury of the flame or else strengthen us to abide it. He then went to the stake and kneeling down, prayed with great fervor while Mr. Latimer following kneeled also and prayed with like earnestness. They were then commanded to prepare immediately for the stake. They then brought a lighted wood bundle and laid it at Dr. Ridley's feet, upon which Mr. Latimer said, famous, famous words, be of good comfort, Mr. Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust never shall be put out. When Dr. Ridley saw the flame or the fire flaming up towards him, he cried out with an amazing loud voice, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Lord, receive my spirit. And continue to repeat, Lord, Lord, receive my spirit. Mr. Latimer cried as vehemently, O Father of heaven, receive my soul after which he soon died. In Acts 6 to 8, we see that the persecution and death of Christians at the hands of religious leaders was not new in the 16th century. In fact, we see the first Christian martyr, Stephen, murdered in Acts 7 for proclaiming Christ to the Jewish religious leaders. Acts 6 to 8 is an important climactic event and transition in Luke's narrative in Acts, and it has great significance for us today. We're going to do things a little different this morning. I'm going to give you the main point, primary focus this morning, and then later in the sermon I'll give you four points of application. So the main point this morning is this, persevere in the midst of righteous suffering for Christ's sake. 
Very straightforward, very simple. Persevere in the midst of righteous suffering for Christ's sake. Again, for those of you who are taking notes, persevere in the midst of righteous suffering for Christ's sake. Now, you'll remember from last week that Luke is flip-flopping between external and internal pressures on this new fledgling church, pressure from Jewish religious leaders, we saw in Acts 3 and 4, pressure from sin within the church, Acts 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. Peter and John have just been beaten by the Jewish religious leaders for being faithful apostles of Christ Jesus at the end of Acts 5. And Luke is showing us in the first several chapters of Acts that this new redemptive historical body, the church, has brought about a shift in worship. God has moved away from the Old Testament temple structures, the temple building, the Levitical uh, sacrificial system, the Levitical priesthood. In fact, we saw last week that many of the Levite priests are coming to faith in Christ Jesus because of the apostles' preaching. Why? Because all of these Old Testament temple structures have now found their fulfillment in Christ Jesus. They've reached the finish line of their race. Their purpose has ended. Jesus has come. Jesus is the true temple. Jesus is the true sacrifice. Jesus is the true high priest. And now the new covenant and its realities are governing God's new covenant people. God has rejected the old corrupt shepherds and priests of Israel. He's ushered in a new, new covenant, a new work, a new leadership, all through the power of His Spirit. The Spirit has been working to apply the work of the Son to those people the Father has elected. And importantly, we'll talk about this in the next couple of weeks, there is no longer a geographical holy place, but rather a holy people. Jesus is king of the world. He's drawing all men to himself. There's not a square inch of the universe where Jesus doesn't say, that's mine. Acts 6, 1 to 7 showed us internal administration problems of widow care that threatened unity in a rapidly growing church. And we also see in Acts 6, 1 to 7, the introduction of Stephen, a Hellenist Christian, a Greek-speaking Jew who was converted to Christ. In this first section, chapter 6, 8 to 15, we direct our attention to the ministry of Stephen, one of the seven Hellenist men appointed to care for widows in the church. And in this short section, we see that Stephen is falsely accused by the Hellenist Jews, who then partner with the ruling Hebrew Jewish leaders to bring Stephen to trial based on false charges. We saw in the previous section, while he, Hellenist and Hebrew Christians are working together to both ensure that there isn't needy one among them and to evangelize the Jewish people in Jerusalem, the Hellenist and Hebrew Jews are conspiring together to persecute, imprison, and oppose the efforts of God's people to preach Christ. It's important to note that the Spirit, the Spirit brings unity between former enemies to preach the good news while sin brings together enemies to stifle the preaching of the good news of Christ crucified. This event is a real picture of the spiritual warfare going on in the early church that continues today. While we strive to preach Christ crucified in a world that hates the gospel, we must remember that we don't battle against flesh and blood but against the principalities and the powers of darkness that have blinded the world. We battle knowing that Christ has secured victory for us through His life, death, resurrection, and ascension. We fight for the faith, contend for the faith from a position of rest and victory. We have been saved. The end. <laughs> we have been saved. 
Christ has purchased our forgiveness by his blood. We have believed this truth and have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. We preach the gospel with humble confidence and freedom because those who will believe have been bought and secured by that same blood. But just as God was sovereign over the greatest sin in human history, the murder of his son, and through the greatest sin in the history, of humanity, he brought about the greatest salvation we could ever possess, forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with God. God also sovereignly orchestrates, permits, and governs over the persecution of his own people according to his perfect wisdom in order to bring about his great and glorious purposes in the world. Luke will show us this point clearly. Your suffering for Christ is not accidental. It's it's not hardship in in a world that's governed by random chance and random mutations. It's suffering that is very intentional and purposeful. And while you may not know what it is that God is doing, and He is always doing trillions of things more than you, could, than you can think in your particular situation. He is doing it because He loves you and He is glorifying His own name. Luke's doing several things here in this passage. We're going to spend at least a couple of weeks looking at it. But, but let's look first at the big picture. I want to hover at about 32,000 feet, not like Chinese balloon 60,000 feet, but <laughs> like commercial airliner 30, 35,000 feet this week. We'll zoom in a little bit next week. Big picture, Stephen is brought before the Jerusalem council just as the apostles were and just as Jesus was at his own trial. These unconverted Hellenist Jews have problems with Stephen's preaching and the demonstrable spiritual power of his ministry, signs and wonders. And just as the Jewish leaders did with Jesus, the Hellenists get men to present false charges with false testimony in order to have Stephen imprisoned or killed. The Jewish rulers were unable to contend with or outwit the Spirit empowered Jesus, so they had to lie in sin to get what they wanted. But ultimately, they got what God wanted. Likewise with Stephen. We're going to see Luke do several things in the passage. Luke is casting Stephen as yet another faithful servant of God in a long line of biblical servants who suffers for righteousness' sake. Opponents of Christ really do hate God and will often oppose gospel efforts up to and including persecution and murder because sin is itself irrational. Our exhaustively sovereign God will vindicate His people on the last day while presently using everything including suffering and evil to bring about his perfectly good and wise purposes in the world. Stephen ministers in Jerusalem with amazing spiritual power. He's falsely accused by Hellenist Jews, and then he stands before the Hebrew Jewish ruling council to stand trial. Luke highlights just in these first several verses a few meaningful ways that Stephen is identified with or reflects one or more faithful prophets who have gone before him in redemptive history. Look at verse 8. Stephen is full of grace and power. He's doing great wonders and signs among the people. The description reminds us of both Moses and Jesus. In Deuteronomy 34, Moses is described as utterly unique in Israel's history. None like him for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants, to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. Deuteronomy 34, 11 and 12. 
Stephen describes Moses' ministry similarly in chapter 7, verse 36 of his speech. This man, Moses, led them out performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. So, Stephen does signs and wonders. Moses does wonders and signs. In verse 10, the Hellenist Jews can't contend with Stephen's spirit-empowered wisdom and speech. Moses, likewise, is described by, described by Stephen as instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And he was mighty in his words and deeds. Like Moses, Stephen is mighty in his words and deeds. And he's so full of wisdom and grace that the Hellenist Jews can't contend. They can't argue with him. They can't withstand him. They have nothing left to say. In verse 15, maybe the clearest indication here, Stephen stands before the council and his face shines like that of an angel. That should remind us of Exodus 34. Moses comes down from the mountain and his his face shines brightly because he was with the Lord. He was talking with God. In fact, he had to put a veil over his face when he was with Israel. Moses does mighty signs and wonders. Stephen does many signs and wonders. Moses is wise and powerful in word and deed. Stephen is wise and powerful in word and deed. Moses' face shines with a holy glory. Stephen's face shines with a holy glory. Luke wants us to see Stephen in this tradition. And of course, Jesus The promised prophet like Moses, but far greater, performed signs and miracles. He healed, he cast out demons with unparalleled authority and power. In fact, Jesus promised that his disciples would do greater works once he ascended and poured out the Holy Spirit on the church at Pentecost. The rulers can't withstand Jesus' wisdom. They ask him a question, he's like, I'll answer your question if you answer my question first. And they can never answer his questions. Jesus' face shines with God's glory at the transfiguration and in his glorified state post-resurrection. Just read Revelation 1. Stephen shines with the face of an angel. Luke is clearly identifying Stephen with Moses and Jesus, even as the unbelieving Jews respond similarly to the unbelievers who dealt with Moses and Jesus. Which we'll get to in a minute. But for right now, beloved, know this. The foolishness and fallenness of this world can never quench the wisdom and glory of God's Son, Christ Jesus. Nor can it quench faithful servants preaching Christ crucified with boldness. The Spirit does this mighty work. The enemy can certainly quench you and crush you. He cannot quench the Spirit's work through you of proclaiming Christ risen from the dead and reigning. So what do we do? We press into the Word. We ask God for power from His Spirit. The wisdom of God will demolish the wisdom of this world. It's not a contest. Christ has won. He's victorious. We should live like it. The victory is secured. Stephen knows it. He preaches boldly because of it. Stephen follows in this tradition of righteous prophets and leaders who do mighty acts for God and his people. So like Moses, like Joseph, like David, like Jesus, like the apostles, Stephen faces resistance from his work on God's behalf. Jesus promised this reality. He promised it. And because he never lies, it happened as he said it would. Luke himself records Jesus' words, Luke 21. It's almost like Luke wants you to know specific promises in his gospel and then to know the fulfillment of those promises in his second work, the book of Acts. Jesus says this. They, I want you to think about, does this sound like what's happening to Stephen? Luke 21, verses 12 to 19. They will lay their hands on you and persecute you delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom 
which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you will, they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. As we continue in this theme of righteous suffering on the part of many of God's servants, Stephen highlights different men in redemptive history who fit this bill. Stephen seems to trace redemptive history according to like the progression of the biblical covenants. So for the purposes of his argument, Stephen begins with the Abrahamic covenant, then he moves to the Mosaic covenant, then he moves to the Davidic covenant, and then he ends with the new covenant and a demand for repentance. God promised Abraham an offspring and a land, but Abraham wouldn't realize many of those promises in the course of his life. Yahweh also promised Abraham that his offspring, Israel, would suffer under oppression, but that God would bring them out of that land into the land he had promised Abraham. Stephen then moves to Joseph, okay? We're going to talk a lot more about Abraham and Joseph next week. Stephen then moves to Joseph, highlighting the fact that Joseph suffers at the hands of the patriarchs of Israel. Joseph suffers at the hands of those men who would form the 12 tribes of Israel. This is important. Joseph is persecuted by the patriarchs themselves. He's persecuted by his own family. Those men who would form the tribes of Israel would sell him into slavery. Moses, likewise, suffers at the hands of his own people, Israel, multiple times. Oh, my goodness. Read the first five books of the Bible, and you can, like, Moses, you're, you're so great. We love you. <laughs> like the best guy in the Old Testament, so patient. I would have, Lord, strike them. But no, 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 no. What a wonderful intercessor pointing to Jesus. Moses suffers at the hands of his own people. When he saves a Hebrew slave from the hands of an oppressive Egyptian slave driver, Luke, under the inspiration of the Spirit, gives us Moses' thoughts that are not recorded in Exodus. Moses believes that him saving this Hebrew guy from an Egyptian slave taskmaster, that that the Hebrews will see that God was bringing salvation through Moses' hand. But they didn't understand. Instead, the Jews rebuff and reject Moses. Who are you? Who are you to settle this conflict? conflict? Like, stay in your lane, guy. So then Moses flees to a foreign land to escape Pharaoh. It's interesting. We're going to talk about it next week. But But in all these situations, God's taking his people to foreign lands. taking them to foreign lands, and that's where God meets them. Even after the Exodus event, the plagues, the Red Sea, the Jewish fathers refused to obey Moses, chapter 7, verse 39, and crafted a a golden calf idol in Exodus 32. Aaron's like, I just, you know, threw this gold in, and this calf popped out. It's like the worst, worst excuse in the Bible in Exodus 32, 33. Stephen brings up these two primary examples, Joseph and Moses, to demonstrate this point from the Old Testament. God's righteous servants often suffered persecution at the hands of their own people, but God vindicated his servants in the end. The same can be said about righteous David who fled from the murderous attempts of Saul. The same could be said about Elijah who suffered under King Ahab and Jezebel. The same could be said about Isaiah who was likely sawn in half while hiding in the cavity of a tree from the wicked King Manasseh. The same could be said about Jeremiah who suffered arrest and abuse and imprisonment, was thrown into a muddy cistern and was likely stoned to death in Egypt by his own people. Hebrews 11 outlines many of these poor but faithful saints. They went around in sheepskins. 
proclaiming the Lord's word, but were imprisoned or beaten and were killed by the sword, by stoning, by being sawn in half, or by other cruel means of execution. And of course, our Jesus was nailed to a cross, a Roman cross, which is likely the worst form of execution in human history, at the request of his own people. What's Stephen's point? The Jewish rulers rejecting Stephen is yet another example in a long line of Israel's history of Jewish rulers and people rejecting God's appointed servants and prophets. They think that their main problems are Rome and all these other Gentiles and all these other people. And Stephen's saying, you you are the one. You and your fathers from the very beginning from the patriarchs on, have always rejected God's servants. But God will vindicate them. Stephen presses the Jewish rulers. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? You want to say, oh, we're, we're, we're sons of the patriarchs. The patriarchs persecuted Joseph. Yeah, we were brought out of Egypt. Our fathers were brought out of Egypt. Yeah, and your fathers persecuted Moses. We want Israel's king. Yeah, and Israel's king persecuted David. And you killed the promised one, the Messiah. You are no different than your wicked fathers before you. So that's the big point. We'll look more at the speech next week. But big picture. God's old covenant people consistently rejected God's servants that God sent to them. And Jesus said the same. And of course, preeminently, they rejected Christ, the Son. So let's let's look at four points of application. The first is this. Expect suffering for Christ. You should expect to suffer for Christ. Expect suffering for Christ. And you're in a Baptist church. These are all E's. So we've got the alliteration working on the... I I have more than one three... uh, More than one... uh, Plus one on the three points, unfortunately. So four points. Expect suffering for Christ. Rejecting God's appointed messengers isn't new to the church because it was the regular Old Testament, Old Testament pattern for Israel to reject God's messengers. Beloved, the ministry of the word will always bring opposition. It will always bring opposition and hardship. Whether it's hardship coming from an unbelieving spouse in your own home, unbelieving husband or wife, unbelieving mother or father, Son or daughter, brother or sister, friend or foe, neighbor or stranger, that hardship and persecution may vary wildly from culture to culture, but the reality is the same. Unregenerate people, especially religious unregenerate people, will often stand diametrically opposed to the faithful proclamation of the gospel. You'll notice that the Jews in Acts 6 and 7 profess sincere love and faith in Moses and God. But then they accuse Stephen in ways that are total odds with the Mosaic Covenant. They say Stephen's trying to undo Moses and his law. Moses prohibited bearing false witness. Uh, That was one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, That's number nine. Exodus 20. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Exodus 23. You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. Verse 7. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. You can't say you love Moses and then disobey him flagrantly in order to 
support Moses. You don't love God and Moses simply by saying that you do. You love God and Moses by obeying God and Moses. These men demonstrate, the Hellenist Jews, they demonstrate that they're willing to break Moses' law in order to wrongly condemn an innocent man. You can't defend God's glory by seeking to so flagrantly sin against him. You can't advance the kingdom by chiseling away at its foundation. A house divided against itself can't stand. If you love me, Jesus teaches, you'll obey my commands. John 14, 21. Just like with Jesus, Jewish leaders and false accusers are willing to disobey the clear commands of Scripture to get what they want. They create a sham trial for Jesus and a sham trial for Stephen in order to maintain their power, their authority, their prestige, their ease, and or their wealth. There is no love of God driving their interactions with Stephen. They simply rejoice that Stephen will no longer be a problem to them. Remarkably, there are many professing Christians today who want to profess love for Jesus while living in unrepentant sin. They act like the religious leaders in the first century who were God's enemies. Holy City's, Holy City's pastors, our experiences with church discipline have largely been tied to people who want to identify as a Christian but then want to live in flagrant sin. I likely... I don't want to speak for Drew and Michael, but I likely have been the most rep misrepresented, rebuffed, slandered, or what have you by religious people who don't want to repent of sin while I call them to turn to Jesus. And it's just reality. Can't take it personally. Jesus said, they're doing it to me. Religious people today still want to be religious in order to assuage or pacify their guilty consciences but they'll also flatly reject God's word spoken through faithful servants. There are other professing Christians today who rejoice at setbacks to the church's mission. Some entire denominations have rejected penal substitution, have embraced same-sex marriage, transgenderism, abortion, what have you. Many rejoice when churches and pastors were shut down and or arrested for gathering during COVID lockdown, both in the U.S. and in Canada. There are many unregenerate people who proclaim Christ while also rejoicing at the increased antagonism of our local, state, and federal governments against the church, particularly as it relates to the issues of human sexuality and gender. So whether it's rejoicing over the Respect for Marriage Act, which is not respect for marriage, or the Equality Act, or rejoicing when bakers or florists lose in court, First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, a large local church with many like-minded pastors, many like-minded pastors coming from Southern Seminary, some were professors, and other pastors there that are actually from Emmanuel. They were in the news this week, largely skewered in the media by quote-unquote Christians in the public square this, this past week for a new biblical statement on gender and human sexuality that all members had to ascribe to in order to retain their church membership. It was, a, it was a statement that was created by the congregation. Not just the pastors, it was created by the congregation. It was a supposedly new statement. It's not a new statement. It's literally 2,000 years. Actually, several thousand years of Judeo-Christian teaching. It's grounded in God's Word. But people are furious about it because they reject the God who has spoken in Christ Jesus. The reality, saints, is that you will be rejected for being faithful servants of the word and for seeking to live righteous lives in the midst of a fallen world. Pastor Drew has been working through Job to talk about suffering, but it's more of a general suffering. Like, God's people will suffer in this world. But, but Stephen shows us that you can suffer in particular for righteousness' sake and standing for Christ. So you're going to do both. You're going you're gonna to 
you're going to suffer in this world, and the Lord's behind it, sovereignly overseeing all of it and keeping you firmly to the end. But sometimes you'll suffer just because it's general suffering, testing, refining, and some of it will be, yeah, I was preaching the gospel and the guy punched me in the face. Don't think it's strange when you suffer. Don't think it's strange when you suffer for Jesus. Welcome to the church. Opposition to your gospel efforts where you live, where you work, go to school, play, should not surprise you because Stephen teaches us that human history is marked by saints suffering in righteousness and being rejected for their faithfulness to God's word. We should not assume that it will be different for us. Suffering for Christ means you've done something for Jesus. That warrants the attention of God's enemies. If you aren't suffering at all, at any measurable level, for Jesus, that should make you examine yourself to see if you're actually shining the line of the light of Christ to others around you. Why? Because people who live in darkness don't like the light being shown on them. And if you aren't shining Christ's light in your life, then it likely means you're consistently living in the dark. The Apostle John says, all the women in the Abide study probably can quote it, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 6 to 7. If there's absolutely no suffering for Jesus in your life, examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. Now, I always have to caveat this in like a reformed church. I'm not talking about suffering for being a hateful jerk. Okay, like, like reformed folks love to be martyrs because you're just a jerk, <laughs> right? I'm not talking about that. Shouting angrily through a megaphone that gays are going to hell isn't a Christ-like strategy for reaching the lost. If you're preaching the gospel and you're warning against hell while also talking about the solution being in Christ, then go for it. But condemnation alone, that's not suffering when people rebuff you. True biblical persecution is because of your righteousness, not because of your sin. If you're a rude, heartless goober, <laughs> when you engage the lost with the gospel, you need to repent. Don't present yourself as a martyr if you're harsh, quarrelsome, or foolish. That's just you suffering for your sin. You fail to love your neighbor. We must speak the truth in love, so we strive for courage, gentleness, godliness, while we preach Christ crucified. Okay, so first point was expect suffering for Christ. Second point, endure all the way to the end. Endure all the way to the end. Going back to Luke 21, Jesus promised us that we'll be hated for, by all for his namesake, but that not a hair on our head would perish. We would gain our lives by our endurance. What does Jesus mean? Clearly, Stephen is murdered. Okay? So he may have lost some hair in the midst of being stoned. What does that mean? How can Jesus say that, say, you will gain your life, not a hair on your head will perish, while also saying that some of his people would be put to death. Clearly, Jesus is saying that you can die without perishing. You can die without perishing. Jesus isn't simply looking at this short earthly life you have in this old creation. This life is a mist. You're here today, gone tomorrow. I remember when my oldest was born, was young, and now he's driving. Not driving as crazy, but driving a car. <laughs> you're here today and you're gone tomorrow. I've got aches and pains that I didn't have 25 years ago. Jesus is teaching us that if you endure with faithfulness to the end, even if you lose your life for righteousness' sake, 
you will gain eternal life. Your life doesn't stop when your heart stops. Your sin-wrecked life in this old creation stops when your heart stops. For the man or woman in Christ, your life doesn't end there. Life in Christ's presence begins at your physical death. Big old party. Why? Because we have died with Christ in His death and we have been raised to new life in Christ with His resurrection, through His resurrection, all by God's grace alone, through faith alone. You will have every single hair, including all the ones some of us have lost prior to death at the resurrection of the dead if we endure in faithfulness all the way to the end. If you're in Christ, you have no need to worry as to whether you will endure or not. You will endure all the way to the end. Jesus will hold you fast, just as He held Stephen fast all the way to the end. Those whom Christ saves, He keeps You can't earn your salvation by your good works, nor can you lose your salvation because of your sin. Salvation isn't salvation if it can be lost by the same people who didn't earn it in the first place. Your endurance in either righteousness or sin in this life will reveal who you truly are which is why Christians must strive to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who supplies you the strength to obey and who will keep you all the way to the end. Spirit and dwelt people will endure to the end, even in the midst of intense suffering for Jesus. Even in the midst of being stoned, you can still pray, just like Stephen. Father, forgive these, forgive these men their sin. Receive my spirit like with Latimer and Ridley. Christ endured to the end in obedience because He was the only begotten Son of the Father and was strengthened by the Spirit of God for faithful living and dying. You, beloved, have the Spirit of Christ. You've been united to Christ by faith. And in your suffering for Christ, you join a long line of saints who have suffered for faithfulness to God at the hands of God's enemies. I envision when we enter into the new creation there will be some form or equivalent of a lot of high fives amongst the faithful saints. Moses and Joseph and David. Well done. You made it. Well done. Therefore, do not grow discouraged when you face persecution but rather rejoice with the apostles at suffering for Christ because God has counted you worthy to suffer for His kingdom. Some of you have suffered insult, scorn, disrespect, even abuse for the sake of proclaiming the gospel to sinners. Don't be overly concerned. Joseph, Moses, David, Jesus, the apostles, Stephen have blazed a glorious, glorious path for us to follow. Suffering for the sake of Christ is evidence of the genuineness of your faith. Why else would the enemies of God pay you any attention? Why would God's enemies pay you any attention if you belong to them? People who are no threat to God's enemies are on their team. It's a badge of cosmic honor. Cosmic honor. Big old Christian Boy Scout equivalent of the little thing going across. What is it called, Timothy? Timothy. Sash. Something better than that. (laughs) Suffering for righteousness sake. A badge, cosmic honor from the Lord to be a threat to Satan for Christ's sake. All right, third point. I the future, so you suffer well today. Stephen made the leaders furious in his rebuke to them. What drove the leaders to stone Stephen to death was that he looked to the heavens and the Spirit gave him eyes to see the glory of King Jesus, seated at the right hand of God. When these enemies of God heard Stephen telling them his eyes were on Jesus Christ, 
the Son of God, at the right hand of the glory of God, that's when they rush to kill him. Stop their ears. Faithful saints endure even when things in this life don't come together as they ought. Why? We keep our eyes on Jesus. Not on our circumstances, but on our Christ. And we see the world as he sees it. We acknowledge that our Jesus is king over all creation. There's no, nothing that anyone can do to us that he doesn't allow. We recognize that Jesus has dominion over all things, including our suffering and difficulty. We recognize that Jesus, King Jesus, has called us to have a longer vision of our eternity than we finite creatures like to express. Our future hope should drive our present faithfulness. Our future hope should inform our present sufferings. You can endure a tremendous amount of pain when you know that good is on the other side of it. We've got some new babies in this building. A woman deals with great pain in pregnancy and childbirth because she knows the glory of a child eventually will be born. Stephen mentions Joseph suffering at the hands of the patriarchs, and I'm sure that part of the reason that Joseph could endure in Egypt was God had already given him a couple of visions. Hey, they're going to be bowing down to you. God had already promised him that his entire family would be bowing down. Moses was able to endure so much hardship from Israel because of God's glorious, glorious promises of redemption and the promised land. We suffer well and endure hardship for Jesus in the old creation because King Jesus has promised that he is preparing a new creation for us and he is returning soon to end our sorrows. He's going to usher in the fullness of life with him and his people soon. We're aliens and strangers in this world. Our true home is with Christ and the new creation. Many of you are suffering for righteousness' sake in this life. It's a reality. Some of you are suffering in your marriage. Take heart. Your earthly momentary marriage, while important in this life, ultimately serves to point you to a perfectly faithful, covenant-keeping husband, Christ Jesus, who will never leave you nor forsake you ever. Remain steadfast, fight sin, suffer well for righteousness, or for righteousness' sake, not for sin in the midst of a difficult or even failing marriage. Some of you are suffering at the hands of family and friends and other people close to you who have belittled you for the faith. Take heart. Your earthly, temporary family relationships will cease at death but you saints will always be a part of the family of God and you will always know and experience the perfect love of your heavenly Father. You will never be looked down upon by your older brother Christ. You will never be belittled by your heavenly Father in the new creation. You will never be abandoned by the Spirit, though friends in this life might lead you because, leave you because of your faithfulness to Jesus. Again, many faithful brothers and sisters have gone before us, suffering under intense pressure and pain, even under death, because they counted Jesus as more valuable than 90 years of pleasure in this old fallen creation. When my children were younger, and a little bit still, because my youngest is, is seven, they would often ask on a long car ride, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And like 12 hour ride from Kentucky, to Charleston, whew, they'd get frustrated, tired of riding in the car. And as saints, we can grow weary and frustrated with our suffering in this life like small kids on a long car ride. Don't lose patience or hope. The destination is coming soon. Either Christ is returning soon or you're going to be called home soon. When in, this new, in the new creation you look back on the few days of your life on this earth, you will not regret having been more long-suffering and patient in the midst of your Christian suffering. 
The Lord will give you grace for today as you keep your eyes on Christ and his coming new creation. Don't lose heart. Stay focused on the cross and the empty tomb. You know the end of the story. Stay faithful to King Jesus in the midst of hardship and suffering today because tomorrow's joys will soon overwhelm today's sorrows. Endure persecution so that you might hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into rest with your God and your King. All right, last point, fourth point. Eagerly anticipate God's vindication. This is a hard one. It's easy in the midst of suffering, especially suffering at the hands of others when you are working out righteousness to want to lash out, to fight back, to defend yourself aggressively, particularly at false charges. And yet we see from Christ silence in the face of false accusations. Why? Because he knew what the Father's plan was. His silence would equal our salvation. Stephen, we see calls for repentance, but no defending ourselves. No defending himself. The primary focus for for Christ, for Stephen, is glorifying the Father and entrusting themselves to a heavenly Father who judges justly. The Lord tells us not to take vengeance because vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. I will. I will. Future tense. So grammar is important. I will repay. Not now. In the future. As we look at Stephen's argument through redemptive history, we see that all of God's people have been vindicated to various degrees. Abraham was given an offspring as promised. His people did enter the promised land according to God's word, even as he waited and looked forward to a heavenly city whose foundations were built by God. Joseph was brought up out of Egyptian slavery and appointed to Egyptian royalty. His brothers did bow down before him. Joseph was vindicated by God. He was the means of his family's salvation from famine. Moses was vindicated by God. The exodus happened. The Lord cared for and defended Moses against his enemies within the camp and from without. When Moses was bad-mouthed by Miriam and Aaron, God struck Miriam with leprosy for seven days and said, don't talk about my servants like that. Moses got to appear with Jesus in the transfiguration. Only two people ever got to do that, Moses and Elijah. David found favor with the Lord, though he endured years of suffering, hiding in caves under King Saul, constantly having spears thrown at him. God exalted and established David's throne over Israel. David was the one to point to Christ. Jesus was vindicated by God by being raised from the dead for our justification and sanctification. The Father gave his perfect stamp of approval on Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection. He raised him by the Spirit to an indestructible life. The religious leaders thought that Stephen's death would stymie the church, but Stephen's death was the means of the church expanding to the ends of the earth. The persecution spread the church out. It's like Obi-Wan with Darth Vader. He's like, you don't know how how we'll become more powerful than you could ever imagine if you kill me. That's exactly what happened. And Stephen's death was also the primary means of God converting a wicked man named Saul, changing his name to Paul, making him an apostle, sneak peek, an author of much of the New Testament, and the greatest Christian missionary in the history of the church. Stephen was vindicated by God. And on the last day, Stephen will be exalted and the Jewish council will be humiliated. 
Like Stephen, you will be vindicated on the last day at the resurrection of the dead. God will also vindicate each of you as you suffer for his name. He will not overlook the smallest details of your righteous suffering. He'll reward you and keep you. You get Jesus. You can trust him when things don't make sense. You can trust him when things look bad. Look at the cross. It looked bad. And then look at the empty tomb and see his glorious purposes in Christ's suffering. You can suffer even unto unto death for the sake of Christ because God will vindicate you in Christ. And may God empower us to trust him in our suffering since he is our perfect defender and refuge.